And I want you to know that it's, I consider it an honor and a privilege to stand here this morning. I would like you to stand with me as we read the passage before us today. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come. We ask you to anoint speaker and hearer alike. If you're not in this, then at best this would just be a speech. But we ask you to come and give life give power and authority to your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As you have already gathered, we are continuing our study in the book of Romans. It's the last one for the summer months. The commentator Leon Morris has stated that the power of this book has been demonstrated again and again at critical points in the history of the church. And he uses these examples. Augustine, one of the great fathers of the church who lived in the 4th, 5th century AD, he came to faith from a dissolute life through the reading of a passage in Romans. Augustine had a godly mother, her name was Monica, who had prayed for her son for many years. And one sunny day, Augustine was outside, and he heard a young girl singing. <clears throat> and what she was singing were these words, pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it. And Augustine ran inside, picked up his Bible, Turn to Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, and he read these words. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And these words struck a chord in Augustine, and he gave his life to Jesus Christ right at that moment. And he became one of the greatest thinkers 
of the Christian faith. And his words are still read to this day. And then Martin Luther. Martin Luther had spent a number of years in the priesthood. But he found that his life was missing something. And then he read in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 17, these words. The just shall live by faith. And Luther's spiritual eyes were opened. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And he became the great reformer. And then John Wesley. Wesley had spent some time in America as a missionary. It had been hard and unproductive work. And on his ship ride over to America, he discovered himself in great fear. He was in a great storm, and he feared for his life. He saw a group of Moravian believers, missionaries, and they were singing praises to the Lord while he was cringing in fear. When he returned to England, he found himself one night in a little church. It's Aldersgate Church, famous church in history. And the preacher couldn't make it to church that night. So one of his elders got up and he read Luther's preface to the book of Romans. And Wesley describes his experience. His heart was strangely warmed. And Wesley entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ that transformed his life and through his ministry rocked the nation of Great Britain and the United States of America in a great revival. These are people who change society through the power of the gospel. And from a personal perspective, although I certainly wouldn't put myself in the category of these great men, and Morris does uh, say that humbler people have come to faith through the preaching from Romans. When my wife Carol and I began our spiritual quest way back in 1980, we found ourselves at Circle Drive Alliance Church. And the scriptures that the pastor was preaching from was the book of Romans. And over these weeks that we attended, he kept making this statement, you have to make a conscious choice. And on March the 9th of 1980, Carol and I made that conscious choice and gave our lives to Jesus Christ. And for the last 37 years, we have walked with him in victories and defeats, but he has been faithful. God's grace is emphasized throughout the letter. Paul understood grace. It came out of his own experience. In 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He saw himself as he really was, as he really had been, zealous for his religious convictions as a Pharisee. He sought and he persecuted believers in Jesus Christ. And he was there when the first martyr, Stephen, gave his life for the sake of the gospel, and he heard Stephen's testimony. And so this letter gives a detailed and systematic presentation of the gospel, describing the doctrine of the nature of salvation, and it's this. We are all sinners in need of salvation, regardless of birth, background, or status. Salvation is by grace through faith. And while salvation is an event when we consciously make the decision to invite Jesus Christ into our lives, 
Nonetheless, salvation is a lifelong process. We experience growing victory in our Christian walk as we learn to die to self and allow Christ to live in us and take control of us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And Paul affirms that Christianity, although rooted in Judaism, is universal in application. Henry Blackaby was a pastor here in Saskatoon way back in the 70s and 80s, and I knew Henry personally. And he and his sons have edited the Blackaby Study Bible. And I've been using it as I've been studying through the book of Romans. And here's how Blackaby breaks down the book. He says the first 11 chapters of Romans deal with the necessity of accepting the righteousness of God. And the last four chapters show us how we live out the righteousness of God in our daily lives. The first two and a half chapters show us that righteousness is needed. And the next two and a half chapters show us that that righteousness is imputed to us by a holy God. It is credited to our account by God. We can't earn it. We're not born into it. The law can't save us, but it does instruct us. Romans 3.20 declares, Therefore no one will be, will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And then Galatians 3, verses 24 and 25. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. In Paul's time, a tutor or guardian was usually a slave assigned to watch over a student to help the student with life skills and education. The tutor didn't have the power to ensure or to change behavior, and neither does the law. It's interesting that following the exile of the children of Israel and their return from captivity, the genuine desire of the people of Israel to live in a way that was pleasing to God led to the expansion of the Ten Commandments to 613 specific laws for living. And out of this arose the sect of the Pharisees to which Paul had belonged, the teachers and guardians of the law, and the people were expected to live by these laws. It was all a genuine attempt to please God. After the history of the nation that had parted and walked away from God, they'd been established to be a witness and a testimony for God to the nations around, to show these nations what it was really like to have a relationship with God and to live for him. And so they returned to the law, and they demand strict adherence to it in the hope of pleasing God. But the true fact is this, that strict adherence to the law, extreme legalism, actually leads to spiritual blindness. You see this in the response of the religious leaders to Jesus. Their Messiah, their scriptures prophesied about him, about his coming. They knew the scriptures. And yet, they reject him and have him crucified. Blackaby points out that Paul does not challenge us to act right, but to be right. We are not justified in the eyes of a holy God by trying to act right, but by being right. The folksy commentator the late J. Vernon McGee, who was the teacher, some of you might remember, and through the Bible, 
he made this statement. God takes lost sinners and he brings them into the family of God and makes them sons and daughters of God. And he does it because of Christ's death on the cross, not because there is any merit in us. But I want to sound a note of caution here. As believers in Jesus Christ, what we do matters. Our actions count. McGee quotes a ditty. The gospel is written a chapter a day by deeds that you do and words that you say. People read what you say, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? We do have a great responsibility. We're not talking about ext extreme grace where everything and anything seems to go, where there is no need for repentance or asking for forgiveness. Works is an outgrowth of faith. It is faith in action flowing from and inspired by our love of God. We are justified, declared righteous by faith alone. And this righteousness is imputed to us by a holy God. That is, it is credited to us by him. So how is this demonstrated in the passage before us? Two great heroes of the faith are highlighted. Abraham and David. Abraham, before the law was given, hundreds of years before the law was given, was justified by faith. And David, who lived under the law, sang of justification by faith. In Paul's day, these two men were held in higher esteem by the nation of Israel than any other two whose lives are recorded in the Old Testament. Abraham was revered as the father of the Hebrew nation, and David was remembered as their greatest king. Abraham is described in the Old Testament as the friend of God, and David is described as a man after God's own heart. But who are these men, and what were they like? Surely they must have been sinless, perfect people. But were they? Let's take a look. Abraham's story is told in the 14 chapters of Genesis 12 to Genesis 25. He leaves his country at God's command and he moves to Canaan. He receives the promise from God that this land will be his and his heirs. In fact, God covenants with him that this will be so. And famine drives him to Egypt. And he fears for his life because of his wife, Sarah's beauty. So with her, he hatches a plot. I'm sure she didn't have a whole lot to say in the, in the making of this plot. But he says to her, I want you to lie. I want you to say, in fact, please say, you are my sister. And he exposes his wife to danger. And Pharaoh, in fact, brings her into his palace, but God saves her life, protects her. And God has promised to Abraham and Sarah that they will have a child. He is the son of promise. Sarah will be his mother. But the years go by and Abraham and Sarah become tired of waiting and so Sarah suggests to Abraham that he take her servant, Hagar, and have a child with Hagar. Now, that was accepted practice in the society of the day. And Abraham agrees to this. After receiving the promise of an heir with Sarah and being declared righteous by God because he believed God's promise, he agrees to this. He's going to help God out in the matter of the heir that God has promised to him. 
And Ishmael is born to Hagar. And today, Muslim Arabs trace their lineage back to Ishmael. It wasn't a great idea at all. And it certainly wasn't God's idea. And this is the friend of God agreeing to this. At age 99, almost 14 years after being declared righteous by God, he receives the sign of the covenant God made with him, circumcision, described as a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, the 11th verse of chapter 4. And the commentator Morris explains it this way, God gave the sign of circumcision, and by doing so set his seal on the righteousness imputed to the patriarch. This righteousness was of faith. It is important to see that the whole point of circumcision, the outward sign, is its relation to righteousness and to faith, that faith which Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. Circumcision had nothing to do with Abraham's acceptance. It was while he was still uncircumcised that God accepted him. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 2. He says, you're not a Jew because you're one outwardly, but it's the matter of circumcision of the heart that is important. And so we are not believers. You are not a believer because you are born in a Christian country or family or attend a particular church or denomination or do good deeds. It's not the outward trappings that make us acceptable in the eyes of a holy God. And it's interesting that it's at this point that Abram's name is changed to Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of a multitude, the promise, the covenant is being assured to Abraham. Sarah, her name was spelt S-A-R-A-I, it means princess. God changes her name to Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, signifying that she would become the mother of nations. And she became that at the age of 90. Surely now Abraham is convinced that he can trust God but is he? Not long after that, Abram travels south to Gerar. And there he tells his king, Abimelech, that Sarah is his sister. Again, exposing her to danger. Clearly, Abraham was not a perfect man. He was deceitful, a liar character traits that continued in the lives of his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. Now, what about David? David's tragic story is told in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. It's the story of a king, instead of going out with his soldiers to fight battles in the springtime of the year, stays back at home. And as he's walking ar around the battlements of his castle, he sees a woman. I don't know if this is the first time he'd seen her. I wonder about that. But she's bathing. And he recognizes that she is a beautiful woman. So he asks, who is this woman? And he's told she is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah happens to be one of David's mighty men. And he has gone off to battle. And David summons the woman to his castle. And there he commits adultery with her. And some time later, she informs him that she is pregnant with his child. And David begins the devious plot 
to try to cover up his sin. He summons Uriah back from the battle and tells him to go and to his wife and to his home and to rest for a while. And Uriah says, no, I can't. The men are fighting for the kingdom. They're exposed to danger. I can't do that. So the next night, David gets him drunk, but that doesn't work either. So off he sends Uriah to battle, but he sends a letter with him. It's a letter to his, the captain of his army. And in the letter, David commands that Uriah be put in the most dangerous part of the battle. And David's plot is successful. Uriah dies in battle. And David takes Bathsheba, and she becomes his wife. But is David at rest? Is he at peace? A child is born. The prophet Nathan is sent to David. And he meets David and he tells him a story of a rich man with all kinds of resources and all kinds of flocks. And there's a poor man who has only one little lamb. And he loves this little lamb. But the rich man takes that lamb because he has a guest coming. He slaughters the lamb and serves it to the guest. And David is absolutely incensed. He says, tell me who that person is and I will have him killed. And Nathan points at David and he says, you are the man. And David immediately acknowledges his sin, confesses his sin, and Nathan the prophet tells him that God is going to spare his life. God will forgive him. Psalm 51, I assure you that is in your Bible. I've been accused in the past of adding a book to the Bible. But Psalm is how you really pronounce it, Pastor Dwight. It's how they pronounce it in heaven. And Psalm 51, you need to read it. Because you will read the words and hear the words of a genuinely repentant man who, when confronted with his sin, immediately acknowledges his sin and seeks and receives God's forgiveness. And Psalm 32, and you need to read that one as well, describes David's joy as he seeks and receives God's forgiveness. And if you read through the book of Psalms, you will discover the heartbeat of this man who truly is a man with a heart after God. What about Abraham? How did, how did he come into a right relationship with God. The passage before us states that faith was accounted to him for righteousness and that he became the father of all those who believe. King Jehoshaphat, in his prayer in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, describes Abraham as God's friend forever. And in Isaiah 41 verse 8, God himself describes Abraham as my friend. How did this man, deceiver and a liar, warrant this affirmation from God himself? We find the answer in Hebrews chapter 11. We're told that Abraham's faith, it was Abraham's faith that led him to obey God when he called him to leave his native land and move to a place he didn't know. See, genuine faith moves us to obedience and to action. 
in verses 17 to 19 of Hebrews 11, describe Abraham's ultimate test of faith. The story is told in Genesis chapter 22. God calls Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. He has waited for this son for so many years. And now God is asking him to sacrifice his son. What would you do? Well, Abraham obeyed God. And he takes Isaac. And you know the story. God spares Isaac's life. It was not his intention that his father would kill him. And provides a ram as a substitute for him. But here's what it says of Abraham. He concluded that God was able to raise Isaac up even from the dead. He was a man of faith despite his failures. Abraham and David were not declared righteous because they were perfect men who perfectly obeyed and kept the law. They were both justified by faith, not works. Paul declares in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We don't earn or merit God's righteousness. It is credited or imputed to us by the grace of God as we come to him seeking his forgiveness and his favor on our lives. And indeed, it is God's incredible grace and goodness that leads us to repentance and the receipt of his forgiveness. So what are the lessons for us? From all of this. Well, number one, and it's important to realize this Abraham and David were not defined by their sins and their failures, and neither are we. As believers, our identity is in Christ. Secondly, we can't trifle with sin. If we as believers continue to compromise with the familiar sins that we tolerate in our lives, we run the risk of God giving us over to these sins. Commenting on Romans 1 verse 28, which reads, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. Blackaby states, God's most devastating response to our sin is to give us over to it, to let the sin we have chosen have us. If God is dealing with you right now, if the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on something specific in your life that is wrong, that you know that is wrong, agree with him right now. Confess it. Repent of it. Seek and accept God's forgiveness right now. First John 1 John 1.9 declares, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He can do it, and he does do it, because of Christ's finished work on the cross. Christ paid the penalty for all of our sins, and through his resurrection, he broke the power of canceled sin in our lives. You don't have to remain a slave to sin. And thirdly, when you have sought and received God's forgiveness for your sins, don't let Satan hold you in the past. 
with its sins and its failures. Satan loves to do this. He's told me often that there are two words that begin with F that characterize my life. Failure and failed. And he wants to hold me there in the sins of my rebellious past. But there's a third word that begins with F that changes all of that. And that word is forgiven. You see, Satan wants to paralyze us with a sense of failure. He wants to try to convince us that God cannot use us because of the sins of the past. But remember that as believers in Jesus Christ, we are no longer defined by the failures and defeats of the past. Commit yourself to the help and the leading of the Holy Spirit who enables us to understand what it means to die to self for the selfish ambition and to live victoriously for Christ. We can't do this in our own strength. We need the Holy Spirit every minute of every day. No self-effort will pull us out of our failures. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers and enables us and brings us through to victory in Christ. And when the enemy comes against you to try to whisper in your ear that you're no good, you can't make it. He told me I shouldn't be up here this morning. You don't have a message to tell. You don't have a message to share. You're an imposter. So how do we respond to the lies of Satan? We remember this. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have the authority of his name and the power of the Holy Spirit to bind the evil one and to cast him out. And you can use the vernacular. I do it often. Get lost, Satan, in Jesus' name. And he flees because he fears the name of Jesus. You have power. You have authority through the name of Jesus and his finished work. And finally, you have a story to tell. Allow the Holy Spirit to use you to point others to the one who loves them and gave his life for them. In the fall, we are going to be launching again the Alpha program. If you haven't taken it, I encourage you to do so. But bring someone with you who doesn't yet know Jesus Christ in a personal way, they might know about him. But if they don't know him personally, you have an opportunity to invite them to explore the meaning of life and the claims of Jesus Christ in a non-threatening way. Over the years that Carol and I have led Alpha at Elam with others who have come alongside us to help to lead the program. We have seen between 12 to 1,500 people come through this program. We have seen lives changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. People who today are in leadership in churches across the city. And I encourage you to give serious consideration to inviting your friends to this. Well, What are we going to do with this? Perhaps you are here today. You don't know Jesus personally. You've heard about him. You might believe everything that the Bible says about him to be true. But you haven't entered into a personal relationship with him. You haven't asked him to come into your life to be your savior and to be the master of your life. 
And I'm going to give you an invitation this morning and an opportunity to invite Christ to come into your life. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, but you know that there are areas of your life where the enemy has been able to get in and you're struggling with things that you know are sinful, and this morning you want to make an end of all of that, you want to say to Jesus, look, I want you to be the master of my life. I want you to lead me and to guide me throughout the rest of my life. I no longer want to be a slave and trapped by the sins that seem to have victory over me. This morning, you can take that step to break free from the grip of Satan. And I'm going to ask you as well to come forward this morning, just kneel here at the altar. Commit your lives anew and afresh to God. And if you would like someone to stand beside you or to sit beside you as you make that commitment, either for the first time to Jesus Christ as your Savior, or the commitment to part with the past, just as David did, and commit your life anew and afresh to God so that he can use you as his instrument of grace in a world that so desperately needs to hear the truth that there is a God who loves them who gave his son to die for their sins. The worship team is going to come and lead us in a couple of, of hymns, of choruses. And if the Holy Spirit is working in you, just come forward. Don't be ashamed and don't be afraid.